Yep, okay. All right, good morning again. Welcome to Palm Sunday. This is, uh, this is a little devotional called Jesus Calling, and today's devotional I thought was pretty, was pretty sweet, so I thought it'd be a nice way to, to introduce our next part of our service. So March 28th in, in Jesus Calling says, I am a God who gives and gives and gives. When I died for you on the cross, I held back nothing. I poured out my life like a drink offering because giving is inerrant in my nature. I search for people who are able to receive in full measure to increase your intimacy with me. The two traits you need the most are receptivity and attentiveness. Receptivity is opening up your innermost being to be filled with my abundant riches. Attentiveness is directing your gaze to me, searching for me in all your moments. It is possible to stay your mind on me. As the prophet Isaiah wrote, through such attentiveness, you receive a glorious gift. You receive my perfect peace. So it said two things, right? It says two things that you need to increase your intimacy with me. Anybody want to increase in their intimacy with Jesus? Right? The, the sensation of his closeness and his presence that's there all the time, that we'd be more tuned into it. So it says the two things that we need most are receptivity and attentiveness. So receptivity, opening up our innermost being to be filled with his abundant riches. Right? We, we close up our innermost being an awful lot. Right? We, 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 get, we get fearful or we get hurt, and so we start to close off parts of us, and we close them off to everybody because we think that we're going to keep ourselves from being hurt like that again. We close ourselves off not to each other, but we close ourselves off to Jesus. So the first one is receptivity, is just saying, God, I'm willing to open up this heart to let you sink in and to let you touch me deeper, deeper than I think that I can dare to be, to be touched, deeper than, I, than my experience tells me that I can trust to be touched. God, I choose to trust and to be receptive to your touch. Because when Jesus comes in, he comes in and he comes in gently. He comes in knowing that area of hurt in our lives. He comes in and says, you know what, I'm here to bring healing, not harm. Right? The, it's not like we put up walls in our lives because there's no reason. We put up walls in our lives and we, we build barricades around us to prevent, we hope, from future pain. Jesus says, let me come in and show you that I can be here and be close to you and not hurt you. In fact, I come to be close to you and I come to bring life and to bring healing and to bring health. But we have to be open. So that's receptivity, right? Holy Spirit, Jesus, I'm open to be receptive to let you come in and, and meet me down deep inside of who I am. Then the second one is attentiveness. And I probably struggle with that more than, more than anything. It's just shifting my gaze and keeping my eyes on him. And if it's, a, it's a discipline. It takes practice for us to keep our eyes on him while we're doing something else, right? To keep our, we, you know, Peter was walking out. We know the story. He's walking out on, and he's walking successfully on the water, walking out to Jesus until he took his eyes off Jesus. Anybody relate to feeling like I'm drowning because why? <laughs> yeah, because you took your eyes off Jesus, right? Keep your eyes on Jesus, right? Because otherwise we're, we're drowning in I think I could probably drown in six inches of water. Don't even need to be out on the Sea of Galilee, right? I take my eyes off of Jesus and, and all of my circumstances get bigger. All of my problems get bigger and more insurmountable. And then you think you need faith to move mountains and you really only have a, a, a molehill. But it's true, right? We make our molehills into mountains. So maybe we do need the faith to call that mountain or that circumstance, that difficulty in our life and call it back into alignment with faith and back into alignment with what Jesus said. I read in a, a, a book that was given to us recently uh, by Jesse Duplantis, and he's, he's talking about faith. It's called The Everyday Visionary, I think. Is that the title? Everyday Visionary? And uh, he, had a, he had a description of faith that I really liked and uh, wanted to pass on. Right, so we talked about, you know, the scripture says faith is the substance of things, hope for the evidence of things not seen. Right, so these concepts, I don't know, they get into the spiritual term, and it's like, how do you, how do you grab that and make that, <clears throat> like, really real? It just sounds too too lofty but Jesse Duplantis says faith is like a good pair of tennis shoes it's like a good pair of running shoes like faith is not the destination faith is what empowers you to run faster towards your destination faith is what en enables you to reach into um, what 
is not your current circumstantial reality, but bring God's reality into your reality. It's like, it's a, it's a tool. Faith is a tool, like putting on a good pair of running shoes. I'm going to be able to run faster and farther with a good pair of running shoes on. And so we strap on faith and we say, this is what God's given me to bring, to bring what's unseen into my reality. To, to have fo- hope, faith, and conviction that says that what God says is mine is mine. Got to be on the, uh, have a phone call with someone yesterday. And I'm like, after the phone call, because they were feeling some physical symptoms in their body. And I'm like, you know what, what Holy Spirit's telling me to tell you to do? Because after you hang up the phone, I want you to go take communion. Right? You repent of anything the Holy Spirit brings to mind that you need to repent of. And then go take communion. And then set your face to draw in from that communion experience. Right? You could, you could do it with a saltine cracker and, a, and, and Pepsi or water, I suppose, if you had to. It doesn't really have to be just this. It's more of what, God, am I, am I drawing down? What is it that's allowing me to touch your reality and bring it in by faith into my experience? So faith is like a good pair of running shoes. Is that good? I like that. I like that. All right. So, Lord, we're receptive and we're attentive to you today. We're going to keep our eyes on you even with uh, whatever's going on this morning. God, we choose to open our hearts up, to keep our hearts open, to receive what you have for us this morning. God, and we choose to keep our, our spiritual eyes poised and fixed on you no matter what else is going on. Father, we choose to be attentive to you. God, we're not here by accident today. There is no just another day in your kingdom. Every day is a day filled with promise. Every day is a day filled with peace. Every day is a day filled with hope. Every day is a day filled with healing because it's what you do every single day. You heal, you deliver, you set free. So God, we're here to receive what you have for us today. God, and to be transformed into more of your image today. So we love you, Lord. Give you permission to have your way in this service and in our hearts today. In Jesus' name. Amen. So today is today is Palm Sunday. Palm Sunday. Am I blanking that or you're blanking that? Can you give me that? <coughs> okay. Palm Sunday. What is it and why do we celebrate Palm Sunday? So this wasn't actually the message that was on my heart today, but I'm like, you know what? That Palm Sunday is like a really, really important day. And it starts and hall- hallmarks the day one of the Passion Week. And so we're just going to run real quickly through the events of the Passion Week, and then we'll get to what uh, I really wanted to share with you this morning. But it is uh, um, the why do we celebrate Palm Sunday? So um, Palm Sunday. <laughs> the, the day one of the Passion Week can be found in three parallel sections of Scripture in the New Testament. You can find it in Matthew 21, 1 through 11, Mark 11, 1 through 11, Luke 19, 28 through 44. And you know that the Gospels are, are written by three different, well, with the exception of Luke, but um, the Gospels are written from different eyewitness, right, 20, 30 years after the events, written independently by different authors saying this is what happened during this time of Jesus' life, right? So um, there's little differences on some details of how some people recall what actually happened on this day. So if you were to compare them all side by side and say, okay, what did Matthew say happened on day one and what did Luke say happened on day one? Maybe just a little things off, right? So um, uh, I'll, I'll give you an illustration here in just a second about something that says happened on day one that happened that I like on day one because Luke says it happened on day one and so we're going to include it in day one on, on, our, on our day one. But the day one of the Passion Week. So everything is pointing towards the fulfillment of the most the most significant day for a Christian in all of history, the most amazing event that happened in all of the universe is what we celebrate on Easter Sunday. So I know this is preaching to the choir, but you guys are the ones who showed up, right? So um, we're, just gonna, we're just gonna run through it real quickly and we're gonna remind ourselves of how amazing this day is because I know you got busy lives, right? And there's a lot of stuff going on and you're like, okay, going to church on Sunday, what about Palm Sunday? So we're just gonna give you a, brick, a quick refresher on what it is about this week that's so special and about this day that's so special. So day one of the Passion Week. So in Matthew's version, it says, When they approached Jerusalem and had come to Bethphage at the Mount Olives, Jesus then sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village opposite you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied there and a colt with it. 
untie them and bring them to me. And if anyone says anything to you, you shall say, the Lord needs them, and he will send them on immediately. Now this took place so that what was spoken through the prophet would be fulfilled. Say to the daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, even on a colt, the foal of a donkey. All right, so um, Zechariah 9.9 is that scripture. And there are four prophecies in Zechariah that are fulfilled during this week. And this is the first one. And this is just pretty amazing. So in, as we celebrate this Passion Week, remember that the fulfillment of prophecies that were... So this was about 500, 500, 510 years before Jesus, right? When Zechariah wrote, right? But then we have another uh, reference here from Psalm 118 in the same, in the same section of Scripture, which, you know, is, is more like a thousand years before Jesus lived, right? Where it says... Uh, blessed is he who comes in the Lord. Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the Lord. There, there are significant things that happen just exactly the way God said that they would happen. Either Jesus said them, or it happened in the way about how he was crucified, about how he came into Jerusalem, about what they sang, about what they laid in his path. All of this is pro- prophesied. There's like over 30 different uh, Old Testament scriptures fulfilled just in this week, right? Between now and what we celebrate for next Sunday amazing and it's supernatural it's 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 incredibly supernatural i can't i can't i've read so many statistics or people try to put this into a quantify it but one of the one that i kind of remember was was about this the, this uh bible college took the math challenge of saying hey, what was the chances of eight miracles being fulfilled they were prophesied hundreds of years and what's just the the mathematical odds of eight of them being fulfilled in specific detail in the life of Jesus. And it was an illustration like you take the whole earth, you fill it with 300 feet of silver nickels, and then you mark one special, you blindfold somebody, and they go pick up that one nickel, right? It was like that, right? I mean, they're they're all so big that any of those examples are just, you know, mind-blowing. You get the point that it's pretty unlikely. And that was with fulfilling eight, let alone 30-plus of of Old Testament prophecies. So that's a big deal as we celebrate... Um, today and as we celebrate what today commemorates which is the most important week for the life of a Christian ever the disciples went and did just as Jesus had instructed them and brought the donkey and the colt and laid their cloaks on them and he sat on the cloaks most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road others were cutting branches from trees and spreading them on the road now the crowds going ahead of him and those who followed were shouting Hosanna to the son of David blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord Hosanna in the highest, which is Psalm 118. So it's a, it's a, it's a big deal, right? There's lots of things you can draw out of this um, passage. Uh, my, my goal today is to just kind of give a quick overview. But the, there's already indications in the Old Testament prophecy in Zechariah that Jesus coming on the, the colt, the foal of a donkey, that, that already says that what everybody's expecting and all excited about on this day what they're expecting is they're expecting the eminent overthrow of the Roman rule. That's what people are really excited about. It says everybody comes out and uh, is singing in the streets and throwing their coats and palm branches in the street. Thousands of people are celebrating the coming of Jesus into Jerusalem because they had a certain paradigm of what this ruler was coming to do. And was mentioned already in the service, right? The first of the week, there, there are thousands of people thronging saying, Yeehaw, right? I'm excited. Hosanna, the new king is here, and this is what we're expecting to come of that. But by the end of the week, the same people are saying, Crucify him, give us Barabbas. Aren't people just fickle? Aren't we just fickle? Right? Today I'm all excited about Jesus, and tomorrow I feel, I feel my emotions are crazy, and I feel bummed and depressed, and so I'm like, who's Jesus? And, and the, the people are just fickle. That's why we need Jesus. That's why we need to re- be reborn from the inside out. We need this spirit to be what gives us our grounding and our consistency, not our emotions. Certainly not our emotions. Certainly not what we feel. So this is, so this is day one. So following on in the same chapter, this is Matthew 21. The same day, <clears throat> he goes in and he cle- cleanses the temple for the second time casts out all the money changers and everything that are in the temple, overturning tables. Then it says that he, uh, that he, everybody who is limping or lame or blind came to him and he healed them all. Okay, so this is probably by 9 a.m., I suppose, right? Right, just, to, just filling his day with just a normal day of the life of our Savior. 
healing everybody who is sick, just like yesterday, and just like tomorrow, doing what he does. And then it says that as he came out and he's healing everybody, it says that the children are yelling and shouting about how amazing he is and saying, Hosanna to the son of David. And that's the, that's the thing that ticked everybody off, that ticked all the religious people off. Do you hear what those kids are saying? You, you're going to let those kids say that to you, right? What do you, right? It's, could you just shut those kids up, right? And this is honestly what started the whole ball rolling with the religious people being ticked off that, that, he's, that he's having this interaction with the little children. <clears throat> so I, I, thought, I thought that um, it's worth highlighting how differently Jesus thought about children, how differently Jesus thought about women, how differently Jesus thought about the minority or the Gentile or the half-breed, the Samaritan, remember, was a half-breed, um, and how significant it was that what Jesus came to model. So this is like, a, this is like a, a momentary contrast of Christianity and the life of following Jesus with every other religion that's ever been out there, which in my, in my way of thinking, there really are essentially only two. <laughs> Right? There's those who worship the one true God, and there's the ones who worship poly, I mean, polytheistic religions, right? And in, and in my view, everything pretty much starts from Babylon, all of the under Nimrod and Sumeramus, if anybody's ever studied that part of history. And this is where, uh, you know, Nimrod was the one who was in charge when they were building the Tower of Babel. This is all Nimrod. And he's a, he's a, he's a mighty man, it says, and uh, war, a warring man, and he united things by force and created this, this city called Babylon. And, and in Babylon, they, had this, they were the first to bring in the systematic worship of idols. And it was primarily Baal, Asheroth, that's what it was, uh, that Nimrod worshipped. And you just see the same religion just cast down generation after generation. They just changed the name of the deities. You know, the Greeks called the same deity something else, and then the Romans called it something else, and the Egyptians called it something else. But essentially, you have... Either you're worshiping one true God or you're worshiping multiple gods. Okay, so to contrast how Jesus treated kids, right? So how were kids treated, right? In, in most of culture and in most of religion, one, kids are treated as this is what you can sacrifice to your demon God in order to appease your demon God because child sacrifice was a significant part of, of virtually all of these religions. Yeah, worship of Molech, right? It's part of the thing, right? To appease the demon gods, you give the, you give the blood of the most innocent in order to appease the demon god of Molech. And we still do, right? We give... That's a, we, get, we can talk after. Circumcision, circumcision is an interesting, is an interesting point, but... Uh, Circumcision was a physical mark that separated the Jew from the Gentile. And we'll get to that in just a sec, because we come back to that. Um, so Christ's treatment of children is different. J Jesus is the one who says, who gives honor and gives actually first place. He says, let the children come to me. Don't forbid them from coming up to me. And he let them come up and sit close to them. So he valued children in that state of being children, of innocent and expressive and free and trusting. And he says, unless you become like that, you can't inherit the kingdom of God. That was, that, was, that was pretty scandalous because you really know value until you're like 30 years of age because then you can be in, my, in my, my army, right? Or now you're of some economic benefit to the rest of the system. Kind of fits a little bit like that today too, right? That this is your true value is your economic impact or your ability to war. Jesus says, no, your value is, is that you are my child and that I love you just as you are before you have any economic validity before you're old enough to hold a sword and go conquer for me, right, you're valuable because I made you. You're my child. It's pretty special. Same thing with how Jesus treated women, right? First person to see Jesus after he's resurrected is a woman, right? People that are so close and in the inner, inner circle of Jesus who had significant responsibility and significant ministry and significant impact in the early church were women. Well, that was kind of that was pretty scandalous in their culture too because that wasn't that wasn't women were still considered property or subjugated or had right and not not that you're you're my child just like right and then with same thing we see how how jesus treated so last week we talked about how uh well 
it was a big deal for Philip to go and minister to the eunuch because the eunuch was maimed, couldn't come into the temple. The eunuch wasn't from around here. He wasn't a Jew. He was a Gentile. And yet God redirected Philip supernaturally to go and minister to this one lone guy who's going to take the message of God's good news, his grace, his forgiveness, even to somebody who was maimed, a eunuch, who'd been physically, surgically maimed, right? And God says, it doesn't matter, right? My, the, the spirit doesn't matter, right? The, the spirit is totally whole. And, but that was a, a big deal and a scandal among in, in that time. So Philip goes to Samaria, then he goes to Joppa, right? Then, so, so we learned... We learned about um, his ministry to the eunuch and his ministry in Samaria. So he's moving from, okay, well, here's just ministry to the Jews to here's Samarians who are half and half, half Jew, half Gentile. So you're kind of moving out. And then the eunuch is totally Gentile. And then he looks ahead into this. If we get there today in Acts chapter 10, he, we get to meet Cornelius, right, who's not only a Gentile, but he's a Roman leader of a battalion of Roman soldiers. Right in another city, totally Gentile. So Jesus is like saying, like the entire paradigm that this world operates under in its view towards children, its view towards women, its view towards minorities, if you will, those who aren't of this circumcised race. Right? God says they're special, and I'll tell, let me tell you why that they're special. Because it's Jesus who brings a view of God that's again a contrast to everything else that had ever been known. He says. And he's, and he's crucified because of it, but he says he refers to God as his father. Well, now, you can't go, that's just a little too familiar, right? God may be a lot of things, but he's not your father. He's not close. No, he's, he's remote, he's removed, he's angry most of the time, and if you don't do it right, he's going he's gonna, to, like, throw a thunderbolt at you or something, right? This is, this is acceptable to fear God and have him some remote and distant place, but to call him your father? Right? They crucified Jesus for that crazy presumption of saying, this is my father. Second thing is, is that Jesus communicated that God is, right? what's John 3.16? Right? For God so, he loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Right? So he introduced to the world a God whose very nature and essence was love. Well, not, not, not anger, not you submit or I, I fry you, not 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 force not compulsion not but love but like free will like i want you to love me back and i'm going to let you do your thing because you have free will and i will woo you with love that's scandalous too so this is this is jesus bringing scandal after scandal after scandal how he tr dealt with children how he treated women how he treated non-jews or non-hebrews how he how he expressed the nature and character of of, a, of God as a father and of a loving father and who says that this is how he intends to communicate and this is how he gives and serves. This is how God represents himself. And I kind of, I, 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 I laugh when I, when I read scriptures that talk about, right, in um, Philippians where it talks about Jesus being a servant and how God himself is a servant. And I know I, I probably beat that horse, you know, a lot. Because it's because it's to just consider that our God is a servant, and that our God's very nature and essence is humility. Because what does the dominant alpha male, I'm the king of the world, king of the sandbox, king of the hill, sound like? It doesn't sound like humility, does it? It sounds like I'm the best, and if you come up here, I'm going to knock you down, right? And and that's the that's the that's the way that we have been. It's kind of way our flesh thinks of what it means to rule. And God just totally blasts that out of the water. Scandal after scandal after scandal in thinking of who God is and how he presents himself to the world. So Jesus, in this situation, it's the children that were the last straw for the, for the Pharisees and for the Sadducees. And he's like, you can't, you can't be just letting these. And then Jesus' response, out of the mouth of babes, out of the mouth of babes, another fulfillment of an Old Testament prophecy that out of the children, well, that, that's really contrary to what was normal in the culture, that the children have any say about anything. But this is what God's going to elevate and value because children, children are precious and valuable and important and represent innocence and purity. And that's how God wants us to be. If we can't come, we, we opened up talking about how we need to be receptive and we need to be attentive. 
Isn't that children in their natural state? Yes, I know they learn how to be sinful pretty quickly. But in their, in their natural state, right, trusting and fun-loving and adventurous and joyful, receptive and attentive, right? When they know that they're loved and they know that they're important to you, receptive and attentive is the natural thing that comes out. And God says, you need to get back to that state. Trusting, simple, attentive, not counting on your warring strength, not counting on that you can beat everybody up in the room, not counting on how many degrees you have, how, how much economic impact you have in your world, how, like none of that, right? It's like the little children who are back to receptivity and attentiveness. And this is what God values. <laughs> okay, then the next section of what happened on day one, and then we're going to go pretty quickly through the others. Oh, where's my Luke scripture? I'm missing a scripture. Can you find my Luke scripture? Somehow it got blanked or something. So in the Luke scripture, if he doesn't find it, it's okay. But in the Luke scripture, it says that as he came into Jerusalem before cleansing the temple, it says that he wept over Jerusalem. And if he finds it, it's cool. But but essentially what it says is that Jesus wept And he says that if you had just known what was before you, if you've known that peace was right here and available to you, if you had seen that this was in your grasp, but you rejected it. And here's what's coming. Your walls are going to be breached. Your temple is going to be torn down. They're going to kill the, your, they're going to kill you all, including your children in the womb. And this is what's coming. And it says that Jesus wept. And I'm like, what, what is it that Jesus sees that's contra, there it is. We'll see if I did a good job or not. When he approached Jerusalem, he saw the city and he wept over it, saying, If you had known in this day even you the thing which made for peace, but now they have been hidden from your eyes, for the days will come upon you when your enemies will throw up a barricade against you and surround you and hem you on every side, and they will level you to the ground and your children within you, and they will not leave in you one stone upon another because you did not recognize the time of your visitation. So everybody's in just a moment... If this is the right, uh, the chronology, right, with Matthew and Luke together. In just a second, as he comes down from the hill over Jerusalem, and this is what he's feeling, right? It's, the, the passion says that he sobbed uncontrollably. Didn't just have a little trickle going down. I mean, he is, he is broken over what is being missed. What the visitation is is being missed by the people, and he sees what's going on. You know, it's like this, if we could just remove free will for just a sec and have everybody just receptive and, and see it for what it is and choose him and boy wouldn't that be awesome you could avoid all of this pain and heartache but but God's kind of not like that right he, he lets us choose and I don't know maybe you can relate to that but sometimes you see people making choices you see people you care about making choices and you're like golly you know I know where that goes there's a cliff right over there and, and you agonize over the choice that, that someone else is making and just like Jesus agonizing over the choices that all of Jerusalem is making. And, but, but it doesn't look like that in just a minute, right? In just a minute, he comes down the hill, and they're all throwing their, right? But he sees ahead, and he sees what's really going to happen. And he knows, what's, he knows what's just about to roll out, and he weeps. So I, so I thought to ask about, well, what is it that Jesus saw that was different than what everybody else was seeing? And we'll go through a couple of things of what Jesus saw. All the slides are out of order. Oh, that was at the end, that's why. Sorry. No? <laughs> Am I on, I got on track? Okay. Okay. Oh, I don't have that slide. The Jesus one. Were you not able to get that one for me? What Jesus saw? That slide. I'm all out of order. The one Jesus, what Jesus saw slide. I had like eight bullet points on it. Okay, well, we'll come back to it. All right, so that was day one. Day two, Passion Week Monday. We're just going to go through these really quickly. On day two, Jesus curses the fig tree. He gives multiple parallels, and they're all about the fact that, you know, the one who bears fruit is the one. He says, take that, take that, the guy that buried his talent and give it to the guy. And they're like, what? He's already got plenty. He's like, no, it's about who it is that bears fruit. Right? You're not here just to sit here and, and build a bigger and bigger barn with all of my goodness and grace poured out to you. It needs to flow out of you. And then he keeps doing what he does. So Matthew 21, it just, it just says that he continued to heal everybody who came to him. He cast out demons. He healed all of their sick. Just 
day after day. That's what he did. Day three. Fig tree withered. He comes back and sees the fig tree withered from being cursed the day before. Checks in at the temple, sees what's going on, openly rebukes the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and he gives seven woes. Woe unto you, woe unto you, woe unto you. It's a whole message in itself, but seven woes that he gives on this day. Parable of the ten virgins and parable of the talents. What's the bottom line of the parable of the ten virgins? Right? Five were ready. Five weren't ready, but they all thought they were ready. They all thought that they had enough oil to get the job done. But those who were, were connected, tied in, had extras of their practice of attentiveness, right? C- connected to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the oil that fills the lamp. In the Old Testament tabernacle, the menorah, right? The Hebrew menorah was, had lamps on it, actually physical bowl lamps that were filled with oil with a wick. And the, we, they kept it burning 24-7. But the Bible talks about how the Holy Spirit is that, like connecting directly to the olive tree. And the olive tree comes in and drips into the, into the bowl. And so it never, ever needs to be refilled and it never, never runs dry. So it is with the ten virgins, right? Ten, five of them were connected and saying, this is not just something I do on Sunday. This isn't just something that I do periodically and come in and check up and say my confession and, and then I'm good. Right, but this is something that's about daily staying connected to the vine, daily staying connected and attentive to my Jesus. Mary anoints Jesus with a costly anointment, and Judas bargains with a Sanhedrin. All on day three, day four, nothing recorded, just Jesus doing what he did. Right, you know what he was doing on day three, two, and one. Same thing he's doing on day four. Right, healing the sick, casting out demons, messing up the enemy's territory. Day five, Thursday, Passover celebrated. Planned every detail of it. Jesus would be slain at the same time the Hebrews were slaying the ceremonial lamb. Jesus washes the disciples' feet. We have the experience of the Garden of Gethsemane, betraying of Judas, arrested by the Sanhedrin, and the trials begin. All of these are so rich. Right? So I know that most of you are the choir, so I'm just kind of skimming over these things, but this is so rich. Every one of these days... Is full, I mean, it's a, e- easy a message all by itself of stuff that we can draw out of each of these situations and circumstances that Jesus was in this final week. But I love the, I love, we get to celebrate communion. You know, this is it's not every, it's not always the first Sunday of the month that Easter gets celebrated, but it is this one, and we get to do communion on Easter Sunday, so that'll be very special. But this is where the, the whole Passover experience and where we draw our communion experience Right? It's Jesus washing the disciples' feet. Something you don't hear talked about in churches an awful lot. Right? We hear about the communion, but in the same night, the same event, the same, the same Passion Week, Jesus says, washes his disciples' feet and says, as I've done to you, so I want you to do to one another. Again, model service and humility as being the nature and character of our Heavenly Father. And I think that's just mind-blowing. And we need to practice it. It's been a while since we've done foot washing in this church, so... We'll, we'll work to get one scheduled, but we have a lesson on it in our encounter class. So if you're, if you're a part of our encounter series, you're going to get a teaching on that. We'll give you the opportunity for that experience as well. But it's super special. If Jesus did it and said do it, then we're wise. We're building our house on the rock. If we hear his sayings, and what? And do them. Not if we just hear his sayings, ah, that was a cool experience back there on, you know, Passover celebration for the disciples. Kind of cool for them. Well, God says if we do them. Day six of the Passion Week, Friday, six trials, three Jewish, three Roman, the third of Peter's denials, the cock crows, Jesus mocked and beaten, trial the people. People choose Barabbas, then they turned him over to be crucified. So just a few days ago, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, thousands of people lay in their coats and their palm branches in the, and from blessed is he and Hosanna to crucify him, give us Barabbas, aren't humans fickle. Christ dies at 3 p.m., veil of the temple is torn, rocks rent, great earthquake, graves open, and walking around the city. Pretty, pretty crazy day coming up, and this is what we celebrate on. So it, it's Friday night to Saturday night, right? So you get, you get the chronology, if you don't understand, that they're a lunar-based instead of a solar-based calendar. Kind of the, the days get off about him being three days in the grave and all that, right? You can study that. It's all, it's all, it's all, it's all good. Um, but... 
let let the Holy Spirit do and bring to life what we're what we're walking out this week. This is a super special time in history, not not just because we're looking back, but right here, right now. And for us to be aware every day as we go through this week that this week right here is the most monumental in the history of the universe. Everything changes. What a, what a great thing for us to be attentive to this week. Right? Receptive. What the Holy Spirit wants to do in your heart this week to make this circumstance and situation, what Jesus did, make it more real and more life-changing in your life. But if we get there, um, we're going to conclude in our little section in Acts because why did Jesus do it all? In Acts 1.8 it says, you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you and you shall be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem, Judea, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. So God does, God does all this. He heals what needs to be healed inside of us. He moves in and starts a, a total brand new work and says your spirit is brand new. Let's get to working this out in your soul and in your, and in your body. And he starts this, this ball rolling of sanctification in our lives. But he says while that ball is rolling, I have empowered and enabled you to be witnesses. Don't, don't forget, this is really a monumental time. If, if what's going on in our world events, here we are a year later after 14 days to slow the spread, right? A year later, could, can you believe it? If, if the trajectory of what the enemy's planning is more control, less liberty, uh, more, uh, less, less available remedy for you to assert and to stand on what God-given unalienable God-given freedoms and liberties. As, as those things are attempted to be eroded into non-existence in our practical lives, w the stakes are going up. This is pretty similar to what was going on in Rome. You know, Rome was pretty amazing, right? Everybody knows Roman roads are still there. They really know how to build Rome r roads well. Their aqueducts, the engineering feats. I mean, they, they were pretty, they had some things really going on in terms of you know how to manage the masses and how to and 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 so they they did it by by force they did it like hey you can either become part of us and it's all big one happy party or we'll kill you and that's it right repent repent and join us and join our join our 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 religious right rome rome was religious it was pagan <laughs> but it was very religious you join us or we kill you so, but there was a lot of good things going on, except that, uh, um, except that people were horribly broken. Morality was at a, at a like a historic low. Um, what what it is that we were s serving to be like, what it was that gave us, it was all Rome. Rome was to be what you worshipped, and the emperor was who you worshipped, and they get to dictate what's right or wrong. The farther we get away from, we have a loving father who loves children, women, and minorities. <laughs> we have a loving father who's the same yesterday, today, and forever. We have a loving father who's who's wants to recreate and renew from the inside out and make you just like him. The farther we get away from that, it may look good in other areas, but we're fundamentally broken from the inside out. And then Easter Sunday, he is risen. Greatest event in the history of ever. And we get to celebrate that next, and we get to celebrate that next Sunday. So invite somebody. We'll participate, and we'll have communion uh, next Sunday. We'll just get to celebrate and worship Jesus for not the fact of all of what just happened, but each of one of these days and everything that happened on each of those days is meticulously planned by God. Like I said, fulfillment of over 30 Old Testament prophecies, meticulously fulfilled. And sometimes it says that Jesus did this, and it says he did that so that it would be fulfilled, what was prophesied by the prophet, whatever, right? And so it's like it's absolutely meticulous and carefully planned out by God, everything preordained by him. But it all culminates right here. And, you know, we all wear crosses around our the crucifix, right? We have the crucifix. It's like... Um, it's like that's celebrating, and I'm not knocking it, really. I'm not knocking it. They're beautiful, right? But it celebrates what part of this experience? It celebrates the death of Christ. But what's the part that gives you power? What's the part that gives you, what's the part that makes it different than any other religion? Lots of people have died in other religions, right? But we have one who was raised from the dead. 
So I was thinking, gosh, if I could get everybody, you know, by next Sunday, a pendant that had a stick of dynamite on it or something, you know, that's like a, you know, it's the dunamis power that raised Christ from the dead that dwells in you. It says in Romans chapter 6, right? I mean, if we can celebrate the resurrection, because that's what totally seals the coffin nails for the enemy. It's the, how do you put a, how do you put, you know, a pendant with a, with a tomb and the stone rolled away, right? Or something, right? So I was thinking a stick of dynamite would be pretty cool. Right, and that beca- and that becomes that becomes our new model of everybody else has got this going on, and and you know we can celebrate, you know his death, but but that's not the exciting part. The exciting part is his resurrection. Amen. Amen. That's what we get to celebrate next Sunday. All right. So what did Jesus see when he when he walked in Jerusalem? What did Jesus see? <clears throat> you can blank the main screen. I just want to too much on there what did Jesus see Jesus saw the real end not just the natural quote-unquote end Jesus saw the real end of what was going on right he saw what was happening 40 years in AD 70 he saw what was happening he saw what was going on a on a spiritually not even global but a universal scale Jesus saw and this is what he saw and this is what he wept for Jesus saw a bride. It says, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. So can you imagine all this going through Jesus' mind? He's sitting up there going down into what all of this next week is going to mean. It means an absolutely total, brutal torturing. It means rejection by everybody. It means all these guys throwing their cokes are going to, he knows what's going on. He knows what's happening. He knows about his betrayal. He knows all of it, right? Jesus sees at the end of it, he sees, you know what? I see a, I see a bride. You know, our, our, our understanding, our vows, my wife and my vows, we see that we each have individual roles to fulfill, made specific and uniquely by God. Each of us with the responsibility to give 100% of ourselves to the other. Your relationships get a little bit of a mess when it's 50-50, don't they, right? Because I think you're giving 49, and I'm giving 51. So we need to have a talk, right? But that's not, that's, not, that's, not how, that's not how God modeled marriage at all. That's not how he, what he did for his bride. He came in and said, 100%, while you're running the other way. Right? Right? While, while we were yet in our sins, Christ died for the ungodly. The bride that he saw was walking the other way, and he says, I'm going to give 100%. Take 100% responsibility for my 100%, and I'm going to give my 100%. And he saw a bride at the end because of the resurrection. He saw a bride at the end who because of what he was doing right now, could get cleansed and purified and made right and righteous by his blood, and that was going to make her a co-equal with him. That sounds scandalous. What? You know, we're the bride, right? We're sort of a little bit under here, right? And Jesus is up here, and we're the bride, and we're under here. It's like, no, I, I, he says, I'm not, I'm not messing with a bride who's, who's, you know, just walking three steps behind me. I'm looking for somebody who's walking beside me. I'm looking for the rest of the fulfillment of all of the manifestation of all who God is. Pretty wild. That's the kind of bride that Jesus saw. He saw sinners changed entirely by, by God's grace. Had this conversation a couple times this week, right? We say that uh, we're, this is Nick's famous, famous quote, Nick makes famous. He says, you know, we're, we're sinners saved by grace. But people say, I am a sinner saved by grace. Are you a sinner saved by grace or were you a sinner saved by grace? Which one is true? If I say I am a sinner saved by grace and I say that my state of being is still as a sinner and, you know, I just, it's inevitable, you know, imperfect that I am, you know, I'm just human, right? I'm just going to stumble and fall and, you know, thank God for his grace. You know, he's going to pull me out of the gutter one more time, right? And that this is my confession. Is it a biblical confession? It's not a biblical confession. So when I say I am a sinner saved by grace, you know, forgive me, but I'm calling God a liar. Because he says I've been made brand new. And that I've been made a new creation. An entirely new creature. And that Jesus looks at it and he sees somebody that's a co-heir with him. Not just a friend, not just somebody walking three steps behind, but somebody who, who is a co-heir with God in Christ. And that's what he says. So... I was a sinner, and I have been saved by grace, and I'm never going back there. And if I trip and fall, then I have an advocate with the Father. Thank you, Jesus, that his grace doesn't stop. 
and that he's, he's walking with me through the sanctification process where my brand new perfect spirit gets to work through a soul with all sorts of stupid thinking and thought patterns that got to get renewed and a body that's got certain habits and, you know, patterns that need to get renewed as it comes in alignment with my spirit. But this is my process. This is our process. Everything coming into line with that new, reborn, absolutely perfect spirit made perfect by Jesus' blood. And this is what Jesus looks ahead and he sees. He saw righteous men and women. He saw communion, union, fellowship, relationship, hanging out with entirely new race of people. It's a little bit like our Jesus calling. Right? Jesus is looking ahead and he's saying, I see people who are attentive. I see people who have, that we have each other's eyes. I, I see people who want to maintain this connection no matter what we're going through. That's worth, you know, having a, having a co-worker in life. Okay? When, when, when we marry and we marry who God has for us, we get somebody who fills up our, our areas of weakness and the two of us are more than we would be separately. And we get to fulfill and serve Jesus together. And this is what unites us and this is what keeps us moving on. It's pretty awesome. Jesus is looking ahead and seeing the same thing. Communion, union, fellowship, relationship, and hanging out with a brand new race of people. Kind of race of people that's never existed before since Adam. Who are made to have that kind of connection and union with God all the time. And to live differently by different rules and different laws. Right? Things available to Adam that weren't available to fallen Adam. And Jesus comes in and he says, I'm going to walk out for you what, it, what Adam should have been walking like in a broken and fallen world. I happen to believe that there were people on the planet other than Adam. Right? It says that he was to be fruitful and multiply. Right? And he was to go out and he was to subdue the earth. Well, I mean, that doesn't mean chop down every tree. It's not what it means to subdue the earth. It means there's somebody out there to subdue, I think. Right? And so, so Adam is supposed to walk out into a, a, a world that isn't made in the image of God. And he's supposed to make it and to bring heaven to earth. He's supposed to be fruitful and multiply and expand the garden to take over the earth. I think so. Well, Jesus did exactly that. He came and he says, where the first Adam failed, I come into a broken and fallen world. And when I come in contact with sickness, the sickness changes. When I come in contact with disease, the disease changes. When I touch the leper, the leper gets healed. I don't get leprosy. Jesus modeled what Adam failed. And Jesus is saying, this is what I look forward to seeing. I look forward to seeing a bride. I look forward to seeing co-workers, co-heirs, who are taking that same heritage, taking it and multiplying across the earth. Be witnesses unto me, in Jerusalem and Judea, and to Samaria, and unto all the uttermost parts of the earth. <coughs> and lastly, he saw, he saw witnesses, as we just quoted. He saw witnesses. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, he saw the Ethiopian. He saw the Gentile. He saw the Sumerians, the half-breeds. And he saw Cornelius, the total Gentile, who was, who was successful in all the things that the world was holding out and was a really a good man. So I think we're doing okay on time, so let's, let's cover this section of Scripture. So I want to introduce you to Cornelius. This is what they said about Cornelius. Two different verses. This is, uh, this is the beginning of Acts chapter 10, and then it's down in 22. And, and so two different glimpses of Cornelius. First part. Now there was a man in Caesarea named Cornelius, a centurion of what was called the Italian cohort. A devout man and one who feared God with all his household and made many charitable contributions to the Jewish people and prayed to God continually. Pretty good guy. They said, okay, so later on in the scripture, so the, the story goes that, and I'm just going to summarize it for you. So the story goes that an angel showed up to this guy who is the leader of a, a, a uh, there were 700 in a, in a battalion, and he had one segment of it, so he was, a, he was the commander over 100, and it happened to be the, what they called the Italian regiment. And it says that he was famous. He was well-known all throughout the community as being a man who was devout. The, another translation says that he was of extraordinary character, and everybody knew it. He was extraordinary character. He prayed to God continually. He met the needs in his local community. He was generous. He was, he was emanating all this of what we'd say, dude, that is a good man. That is a good man. He led well, right? His soldiers followed him without question, and he's a man of incredible integrity. That's pretty awesome. 
right? It says that an angel showed up to him in bright clothes and says, you know what? I want you to, well, first of all, he says, the angel says, your good deeds, all of your acts of service and your humility and your prayers have ascended to the throne of God and he's heard your prayers. And he sent me to, send, to tell you to go send for Peter, Peter, who's in Joppa, who's staying at the house of a guy named Simon the Tanner, whose house is by the sea. And I want you to go and call him to come to you because he has a message for you. Cool. All right, so the centurion gets up. He sends two of his faithful servants and one of his, his, his main right-hand man, soldier guy. Then he sends them to go and round up Peter. At the same time, at this exact moment, Peter is having a vision. Says he was hungry. He went up to the rooftop while they're cooking his lunch. He goes up there and he falls into a trance. It says actually that he that he uh, he says he he like was an out of body experience. He had a he fell into a trance. He had this vision, and the vision was to a to a, a to a good Jewish boy, uh, a sheet carried by four corners being lowered down from heaven, and then it were unclean and clean animals both. And the voice comes from heaven and says, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. And Peter says, You know, I'm a good Jewish boy. You know, I don't eat anything unclean because I know the law. I'm circumcised, right? I've been set apart. I've done all the outward stuff, and I'm, I'm faithful to not eat anything unclean. Says it comes to him three times, right? Who's the guy that denied Peter or denied Jesus how many times? How many times did Jesus ask him, Do you love me, Peter? Three times, the guy's just something about the number three. Three times this, this, this comes down from heaven. And he says, rise, Peter, kill and eat. Don't you call unclean what I have called clean. And Peter just, just says he's just thinking about it. He's just pondering what those mean when a knock comes on the door. Hey, is Peter here? And at exactly that moment, isn't it just like God? It's just like uh, the, the centurion last week, Right? Well, hey, I just happened to be here on this desert road, and hey, look, there's water there, and why don't I get baptized right in this desert place? It just happened to be by a lake in the middle of the desert. Just like God to ordain events just like that. And he does. He, he orchestrates this, this encounter just like with the eunuch. He or, ordains it with Cornelius. And they're knocking on the door. Peter comes down invites these Gentiles into his home, forbidden. You're not supposed to hang out. You're not supposed to have fellowship. You're certainly not just supposed to have a meal with Gentiles. So he starts breaking the rule, right? The moment that this vision and the curtain goes back up, the moment he comes back down, he's already, he's already saying, I guess, God, you're trying to teach me something. You're trying to deal with the prejudice in my heart. You're trying to deal with this, 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 uh, this old law paradigm and trying to give me a new law paradigm and uh but it's a but it's a paradigm shift for me fundamental paradigm shift so he goes he invites them in they spend the night and he goes with them the next day so it's 31 miles right if you're walking three miles in an hour you're 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 10 hours later you're showing up at cornelius's house and it says that he and his family were all there. He says it was, the whole house was filled, standing room only. As he said, you know what, I, I got to hear what God said that you're supposed to tell me. Okay. So here's the other description. So this is as they knock on the door and they introduce themselves. Here's what they say about Cornelius. They said, Cornelius, a centurion, a righteous and God-fearing man, well spoken of by the entire nation of the Jews, was divinely directed by a holy angel to send for you to come to his house and hear a message from you. Like I have any expectancy that you're going to come because it's against the law, right? But I'm being obedient, and this angelic encounter has, has given me certain instructions, and so Peter gets up without hesitation, and he goes to meet with Cornelius. I just want to highlight what, what a great reputation Cornelius had. Cornelius is... Um, Cornelius is a really, really good man. And if anybody should be able to, to if anybody should be able to come and, a, and have a relationship with Jesus, and if anybody is going to get into heaven by being good, sounds like he's like front of the line. Doesn't it sound like he's the front of the line? So, I mean, like, what's to improve about this guy? He's a good reputation about the entire nation knows him and loves him. His soldiers honor him and respect him. He's of, he's of, impeccable character and integrity well how do you improve on that so he calls for Peter and we're going to read from uh, in verse 34 just this last section so 
Peter comes into his house. Cornelius tells him the story again of the angel showing up, and he just told me to send for you, and I sent for you, so here you are, house full of people waiting with bated breath to hear what you have to say. <clears throat> so in verse 34, opening in his mouth, Peter said, I most certainly understand now that God is not one to show partiality, but in every nation that man who fears him and does what is right is welcome to him. The word which he sent to the sons of Israel, preaching peace through Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. You yourself know the things which took place throughout all Judea, starting from Galilee and after the baptism which, jo which John proclaimed. You know of Jesus of Nazareth, how God anointed him with the Holy Spirit and with power, and how he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. We are witnesses of all the things he did, both in the land of, Ju of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They also put him to death by hanging him on a cross. God raised him up on the third day and granted that he become visible, not to all the people, but to the witnesses who were chosen before by God, that is, to us who ate and drank with him after he arose from the dead. And he ordered us to preach to the people and solemnly to testify that this is the one who has been appointed by God as judge of the living and of the dead. Of him all the prophets bear witness that through his name everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins. So what's Peter doing? Peter's taking this good guy, right? This, this man who's got a lot, of, a lot going for him in integrity and his devotion to God, sincere in his walk, sincere in his following of God, and he's a Gentile. So he's a, he's a Gentile convert to Judaism. That's, you know, you, I, I don't, it's, it's kind of wild, right? Holy Spirit has to be doing the drawing because you're, you're an outcast. You really can't ever fit in. You're not allowed to go into the temple. You're not allowed to do all the things that the Hebrews do. So you have to, I mean, there has to be something inside of your heart that is, that is not going based on all the other benefits of being a Hebrew. You didn't have access to the Hebrew court system. The Sanhedrin was only, right, all of this stuff, right? You know how, what a big deal it was for the guy who says, uh, well, this one thing I know I was blind and now I see. It says that he was then cast out of the, that was a big deal. That was like being ostracized from everything that was your cultural advantage, everything that made you acceptable, that gave you employment, that gave you acceptance, that made you fit into this massive community, right? Uh, you, you lost it all. And a, he, and, a, and a Gentile coming into that same culture is like, you know what, it's got to be the drawing of the Holy Spirit. It's got to be a sincerity of heart that, that, um, that isn't drawn by all the other benefits. So, um, of whom all the prophets bear witness that through his name, everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins. So Peter is sharing the gospel with this really good man and why it's important that this person, Jesus, that you heard about in Galilee and what he's here for. He says, the Old Testament prophets proclaim, it's all consistent. It says that everyone who believes in him and rece receives forgiveness of sins. It says in verse 44, while Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who were listening to the message. All the circumcised believers who came with Peter were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also, the uncircumcised. Okay, so he's in the middle of his talk talking about why Jesus and that everybody who receives and believes in Jesus received forgiveness of sins and his whole message is interrupted by the Holy Spirit coming down and, he, and it says they heard them all speaking in, in other tongues. Amazing. So, you know, we've been talking about how um, Peter said in Acts chapter 3 what must we do to be saved and he says well you repent be baptized and be filled with the Holy Spirit well so like God's already messing up the order right so in this case it was it was well we guess they repented perhaps they were familiar with John's baptism we don't know it doesn't say but that was the repentance and confession part if so right and then it's and then it's be baptized and be filled with the Holy Spirit but but God says well we'll just skip number two and we'll go right to number three and then we'll back up and we'll catch up on number two but he still says that he wants us all to participate in the entire experience. Repentance, confession, baptism, and baptism of the Holy Spirit. So that was, verse, uh, that was verse 44. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon those who were listening to the message. All the circumcised believers who came with Peter were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also. For they were hearing them speak with tongues and exalting God. Then Peter answered, Surely no one can refuse the water for those to be baptized who have received the Holy Spirit just as we did, can he? And he ordered them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they asked him to stay on for a few days.
So, um, what a crazy, what a crazy experience. It's like Jesus seeing ahead, and he's saying, you know what, I'm going to have witnesses. Jesus looking ahead, and he says, it's gonna, and, and my bride is not just going to be just the Hebrew bride. My bride's going to be those who have a heart after me or sincerely following me that are the half-breeds, that are the maimed, like the eunuch, that are the Gentile, like Cornelius. And he's saying, you know what, my, 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 my bride is, and that that is my body, and that that I'm inviting into being co-heirs and co-equals with me to walk right here beside me right is is getting bigger and bigger and bigger and it doesn't matter what color you are it doesn't matter what gender you are it doesn't matter whether you're old or whether you're young it doesn't matter he says it all comes through this same gate if you believe on me that you you receive forgiveness of sins that's sensational right and that message was so exciting to them that they broke out in a praise and worship service right in the middle of his talk and they received the baptism of the holy spirit that, thank you, Jesus. That's awesome. That's the same section of scripture. So what do we learn? <clears throat> A couple of closing thoughts. God is passionate about restoration and relationship. God is still passionate. We call this the Passion Week. God is still exceedingly passionate about restoration and relationship. He's not after making just good people. Otherwise, we would have been good at Cornelius. But people remade in his image who think and act like he does. I think that in the, in the church today, sometimes we, uh, we, we kind of we downplay the importance of this. Uh, uh, like I think that sometimes in the church we're just trying to make good people. I mean, as long as you, you know, come in and you're not disruptive on the service, right? as, long as, you, uh, as long as you, you know, all of your, a lot of your major hiccups are dealt with in your life you know and as long as we can hang together right then we're, we're okay with you know a certain element of like Cornelius like who wouldn't like hanging out with Cornelius like, I loved hanging out with Cornelius what a, what, a, what a good guy to hang out with right everybody loved him and knew that he was of impeccable character that's pretty awesome but it's not enough um, maybe, maybe you're here with the same impeccable character and with a good reputation throughout the entire nation because of how good you are but it's not enough that's not good enough. That doesn't even, that doesn't even get, that gets you into the place where God can send a messenger and draw you to hear his message of life, right? That might get you there, but it's not getting you to where Jesus is inviting you. It's not getting you to become his bride. Sometimes maybe we're content even in our own lives with, with, well, I'm doing better, I think, than I was doing last year. And I think I've grown in this area, but are we just working to transform from the outside in? Or are we saying, God, I'm going to be receptive and attentive, be really receptive to let you fundamentally change me from the inside out? And God, I'm going to confront every time when you bring it up that, that, that my thinking is wrong. I'm going I'm I'm to let you process it all the way down and change the way that I think, which is what repentance means. Repentance means to change the way you think, right? To let, to let you change the way that I think so that I look out of the world and I look at you properly. I look at myself the way you say about me. And this is then how I live in my world. I don't live in fear. I don't live because other people are trying to put things on top of me. I don't, I don't live based on anything other than I want to serve him and I want to be a witness unto him. <clears throat> Number three, believing in and trusting in Jesus Christ, being water baptized and filled with the Holy Spirit is the gate into a new life, following Jesus' example of trust and obedience. Kind of sounds like that childlikeness again, doesn't it? Following Jesus' example, Jesus himself was childlike because he didn't have all those self-protective mechanisms that he's built around his life that, that have been formed by being pressured to please someone else other than the Father. And lastly, to encourage you to choose him today because he already chose you. Jesus already chose you. He chose you. He chose, he called you. And the difference between the scripture talks about those who are called and those who are chosen, and that there's a difference between the called and the chosen. But the call is to everyone, right? But the chosen kind of has to do with the fact that you're free to choose. And if you haven't had opportunity, if you haven't taken opportunity to choose him today, then what an awesome day to choose him. This is the day to choose him and to say, I surrender, right? I am, I am, I am yielded, I am 
allowing you to come in and to transform me from the inside out. Enough with trying to be good on the outside. I, I need your transformative power on the inside because the only way to, to get forgiveness of sins is accepting the substitutionary work of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, the purpose of this week, Jesus Christ coming in and paying the penalty that I deserve because of my choices to sin. We're all born as uh, into this human experience and we're born into sin because that's the genetic, that's, that's what's passed down in the DNA is a sinful nature. It means that you are born into sin and you're leaning into sin and yet you still have free will. So you can still choose to do good things over here, but you cannot stop sinning. Your propensity, your nature leans into sin. And ultimately you try all you want to put it on the outside here, but you are still a slave to sin. Jesus Christ comes in and through the power of water baptism, baptism of the Holy Spirit, he makes and gives you a brand new spirit we just the the uh, it's Ezekiel I think right where it says that he'll take out your old stony heart and give you a, a, a heart of a heart of flesh he's not just trying to to take all the garbage and put clean clothes on top of it he's coming in from the very inner core and he's wanting to remake it from the inside out like we say before it's not a remodel it's new construction right we're knocking it all the way down and we're building back up from there and it's going to build a brand new creature that's never existed before you're going to become something brand new right but i have made choices to sin a sin is either doing what i know not to do or not doing what i know that i should do sin of omission and so sin of commission right so this is sin and we were all there and if we're there even one even one sin how many times do you have to sin to be a sinner just once right right how many times do you have to lie to be a liar does, doesn't take a bunch, right? How many times do I have to cut that communication, the line between me and God? How many times does that line get cut and, I, and my communication is severed? It just takes one. Well, most of us who are honest will say we've got way more than one going on. And that deserves a penalty. The wages of sin is death. It's been that way since Genesis, right? And the death is eternal separation from God. I can pay it. And pay the price for my own and spend eternity separated from him, which we call hell. Right? Or I can let somebody else pay that substitutionary price for me and serve that sentence for me. And then say, I've paid that penalty. Jesus did all of what he did this week. And then Jesus actually says that he went down and took the keys of hell and of death. He actually went to hell for you. Right? Jesus took the curse for you. I say in one of our... Right? The good news about sin is that Jesus came, became sin for you. The good news about hell is that Jesus went there for you. The good news about the penalty that you deserve for your choices is that Jesus paid the penalty for your sin. And that's, what we, that's when we believe on him. It says that, just, we just read it, right? It says that Peter said to Cornelius that he who believes on Jesus receives forgiveness of sins. All for receiving forgiveness of sins? That's a pretty good offer today. Going once, going twice, right? And that's not all. Right? It's all it's all on the table for us to respond to and then to uh, participate in water baptism, baptism of the Holy Spirit, get the whole deal and get on to living the life that Jesus has called us to live. So if you haven't had opportunity to receive, Jesus is paying the penalty for your sin to restore relationship with you to the Father and make you co-heirs with him, then what a great day to do it. Palm Sunday, 2021. And then to be attentive all this week, and this is my encouragement for all of us, be attentive all this why I went through what happened on each of those days, right? It's really special. You maybe want to go through the, the sections in, in Matthew and John and in Luke about the Passion Week and just let, let those stories and the reality of what Jesus, how Jesus lived out his relationship with the Father and how that interacted a broken and fallen world because that's the second part, right? He's called you to be a witness unto him. He's called me to be a witness unto him. That means that I don't, just, I don't just hoard it, but I give away what he's given me. Amen? So let's just all agree in prayer to, together today. And if you haven't received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, then what a great day to memorialize it. If you've been, if you've been walking your own, trying to be that good guy and trying to work by your own efforts to try to be better, then maybe, you, maybe today's a great day for you to repent of that because you're not going to get there working it on your own. 
The only way we get there is with the same power. That's why it's the stick of dynamite, right? The word is dunamis. Romans 6 says the same power that raised Christ Jesus from the dead now dwells in you. What's it dwell in you for? It dwells in you to live the life that models him. It lives in you to be witnesses unto him into Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. If you're trying to do it on your own, it's time to repent. Today is the day to repent. And let him do that work and do that transformation. And then you just step forward in obedience back to childlikeness and say, Jesus, I'm just going to be responsive, obedient, and, and walk out this life that you call me to walk out. So let's just all pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this, uh, this Palm Sunday. We thank you for what it commemorates about all the events that you walked out 2,000 years ago on this earth in order to have a relationship with us. We thank you, God, that you looked ahead. We thank you, Jesus, that you looked ahead and you saw a bride. You saw righteous men and women who were co-heirs with you. So, God, we choose you today. Lord, if this is the, if this is the first time for anybody here today, then we invite you. We invite you and we choose to believe on Jesus for the forgiveness of sins. Would you repeat after me? Say, in Jesus' name, I receive all of what you've done for me. I receive forgiveness of sins. I believe in you that you died, that you paid my penalty, and that you raised from the dead. I am made brand new because you live inside of me. Thank you, Jesus. Father, we thank you for this, uh, for this morning. And God, if there's people here that, are, that just need to recommit their lives to you, it's exactly the same. God, we, we, we just tend to want to take control and do things the way we see fit to try to make ourselves better from the outside in instead of trusting you to transform us from the inside out. So if that's true for anybody here, God, we just thank you that today is a day of rebirth and today is a day of recommitment, that that Palm Sunday 2021 is going to be a day of newness. So we thank you for it. We bless each and every one. We thank you, God, for the new journey that's beginning, and we love you and we thank you. Father, we pray, would you overthrow every power in this nation and in this, these islands that it set themselves against you and your plan? God, would you give us righteous leaders who fear you and who follow you and want to see your rules, your precepts? God, your plan acted out in our lives. We agree and declare in faith that the light will shine undeterred, demolishing darkness. In faith, we declare that the truth is unstoppable. It is dispelling and exposing all falsehood. In faith, we pray that those setting traps for others would fall into their own traps. And in faith, that what the enemy means for evil, you, Lord, would turn gloriously to good. And this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.